Um, Remind me how we get a tangent plane to a surface. This is a relatively easy to remember process because it's analogous to the tangent line equation. So z minus z naught yeah. equals fx, x minus x naught, or excuse me, yeah. xy. Yeah, yeah, evaluate it at whatever the point is. Right. x naught y naught. x minus x naught. And then fy, x naught y naught, y minus y naught, I like it. Okay. Doesn't that look like, uh, isn't this the parts of the gradient at that point? What is the gradient? Remind me, the gradient. It's crazy, man. I like it. So this, this part looks like the gradient evaluated at that point, dotted with some kind of a uh, change in position. All right. So if I'm talking now about, uh, uh, and actually let's talk more directly about this. Uh, if I have a four-dimensional object. Now the reason we talk about four-dimensional objects is when we talk about three-dimensional objects, how many dimensions do I actually kind of work with directly here to deal with it? Two. And that's kind of like my input plane. I work with that stuff directly, and I think about, well, what's happening to my heights as I do stuff with my input plane? Are you guys kind of following my point here? So when I have a three-dimensional object, I actually sort of just work with two of those dimensions directly. Okay, okay, good. So the reason we talk about four dimensions, even though we can't adequately uh, display them in our three-dimensional world, is because the work I would do would be in three dimensions. So I can talk about the tangent plane to a level surface. So uh, what do we normally talk about? We normally talk about uh, level curves, right, for a surface. Now I can talk about level surfaces for a four-dimensional object. Oh, shit. Okay, 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 maybe. All right, this is kind of nice. Uh, believe it or not, he's like, yeah, sure, I'll believe it. Uh, let's see. So, so if I have, so what I'm saying is this here. Now that that if I put a, a number that we've looked at this before, this is for example x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals nine. What is that the equation of? No, no, no x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9. Sphere. Normal sphere. I like it, right? I'm with you. You're with me. Maybe. We've seen that before. I mean, if I put some minuses in there, I get some other stuff, whatever. Put some different uh, values for the coefficients, I get ellipsoids and all this kind of stuff. The difference between that and this is that would be one level surface for this four-dimensional object. Okay. Now, now. If I wanted to find the tangent plane to this level surface, okay, and this figures in some of the homework problems. Um, one thing I could do is hopefully it kind of makes sense. I can attack this with derivatives. Let's attack this thing with derivatives. So well, how would I write this bad boy out? If I want to attack this with um, uh, derivatives where each of these, let me be a little more specific, each of these is x of t, y of t, z of t. So what would this look like? Partial x and a dx dt, because x is only one, a function of one variable, so I don't need a partial symbol there, plus partial of f with respect to y dy dt, plus partial of f with respect to z dz dt, and that is going to equal 
Zero. Cool. I like it. Now, now, now. All right, let me just let that sink in. Yes, sir. Would this be analogous to finding a tangent line to a level of curve? Yeah, there's going to be, well, we're going to find out that, uh, well, remember, tangent lines are analogous to this. Now I'm gonna, we're going to do the work and then I'm going to show that tangent, and this is a tangent plane to a surface. So this should be directly related to this. This is just, this is one level up, but I'm only looking at a single surface, right? Okay. Single level surface. All right. So these actually are going to be sort of, they should look very uh, similar at the end. We're, all, we're almost there, believe it or not. You're going to start, hopefully, to look at stuff like this, additions of multiplications, as what things? What, what thing have we learned this semester that deals with multiplying and then adding stuff? Dot product. I love it. Kick ass. So this, what is this all together? That's the gradient of F. I like it. And the gradient doesn't care how many dimensions you want to live in or that you do live in. It's just like, I'm here for you. Dotted with, oh shit. Now what's this here? X of T, Y of T, Z of T. Oh, it's R? Yeah, that's R of T. I like it. So this would be dotted with, now what's, so then what's dx dt, dy dt, dz dt? R prime t. R prime of t. And that equals zero. Let me stop there for a second. How is this related to this? In fact, what is this a piece of making? If I divided this by its length, I've created the what? What is this divided by its length? Unit vector. Unit tangent, tangent vector. vector. So this is tangent to the surface. And since I dot it with this and I get zero, this must be perpendicular. perpendicular. So it's, it's, a, it's normal to the surface. So this bad boy would be the normal vector for the plane that I want. Oh, shit. Sure, whatever, Jeff. Let's go with me for a second. All right, now watch. That's kind of cool. Uh, so now I got, so this is going to be the normal, and it's got these components to it, so fx, fy, fz. Uh, and, and so what's my, my equation of a plane? Blah, 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 blah. Is that right? Where A, B, and C are the components of the normal. So now it's going to be Fx, X minus X naught, plus Fy. And of course, these are evaluated at the point. Is that cool? Just let me save some time writing. Fy, Y minus Y naught, plus Fz, Z minus Z naught equals zero. Now that, now, now the one difference between this and this seems to be, of course, this guy. And I want you to realize this is doing the same thing this does, but what if my surface can't be solved for z, like z is being raised to the fourth power or something. So this gives me a general approach to handling that. This works if I can solve for z. This works beautifully. But if I can't really solve for z and I don't want to feel, I don't feel like splitting it up into whatever many parts I've got to do to do each of the parts through that shit. Let me just do, create something that works. I'm sort of saying I'm in four dimensions, but in reality I'm not. I'm in three. Everything I've done here is like three dimensional. So good, watch, this is going to be, uh, if in reality, so, so this is true, this is bam, this is the level surface, the tangent plane to any level surface, f of x, y, z. Now watch, if in reality, if f of x, y, z 
is actually equal to, oh, how did I want to say it? Oh, sure. Uh, oh, so for example, if uh, z equals f of x, y, right? z equals f of x, y. That's what I really have. This better boil down back to this. I want you guys to realize, this is the more general approach. This is generally true. If I'm in the special case where I can actually solve for z, then it better become this. Want that understood. So this works even if you can't solve for z. This will work. We didn't have something for that before. You didn't even know to worry about it because we didn't ask you any questions about it because you couldn't do it yet. <laughs> but now I could give you an ellipsoid or something where everything's squared. You can't really solve for z, not nicely anyway. So now we have an approach for doing the tangent plane to that surface. Uh, but if I say, oh, I can solve for z, well, this better freaking become this or the whole thing's bullshit. Right? Anytime I have a more general approach, it's got to become the old approach under the old assumption. Um, so when you did that, when you made it four dimensions, basically, and got the gradient there, yes, that was the normal to this plane. But if we were to do it the other way, then it would be in the plane, wouldn't it? So if I take it back to level curves... How is the gradient related to any level curve? Who remembers this? Level curves means if I walk along it, I don't change my height at all. The gradient points in the direction of the greatest increase in height, right? So therefore, the gradient actually has to be perpendicular to the level curve. So this is that in a dimension up. So if I have a level surface, the gradient must be everywhere perpendicular to that level surface, the same way that for a level curve, it must be perpendicular to every point on that level curve. It's always going to point towards the highest, the, the, the direction of highest increase. But that, but that is like a different gradient than the one that you would get for a three-dimensional gradient. Like, correct? But the reasoning is exactly the same. It's just stepped up another dimension. The reasoning is exactly the same. But when you take it up another dimension, it'll be perpendicular to the old gradient, if you will. Oh, I see what you're trying to do. All right, all right, all right. Because okay. that, that was just kind of strange. Let's not do that. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, all right, now, now watch. Uh, really? All right. It's not really four-dimensional, though. I love it. It's not. Just like when I draw level curves, are these three-dimensional? No. Can't I do a lot of shit with these? In fact, haven't I been writing two-dimensional vectors? Uh, uh, right? The gradient is a two-dimensional vector because it talks about direction of motion and direction that I'm moving is completely determined by the inputs I use. And they live in two dimensions. So that's what I meant by Everything we did before, we, we dealt directly with two dimensions, even though we know we're talking about three. And that's what I, my point was before. We work in the two, but we got to keep in mind it's all about what's happening in the third dimension. That's kind of, but we really just work directly in two. So for this approach, I'm going to pretend like I'm in four dimensions, because then I can work directly on a three dimensional object. All right, so it's sort of a neat little trick where you're like, I don't want to go into four dimensions. All right. We're not really. We're just pretending like we are. I'm in the fourth dimension now. You know, whatever that means. Whatever sound would escape when you make that transition. I don't know. Uh, somebody help me out. Let me, let me give you a specific example. If I had z equals x squared minus y squared x or something, what would big F be? How do I get big F? Okay. Yeah, get z on the same side, right? Okay, okay. So, z is a function of x and y. That means big ass f would equal f of x, y minus z. All right, nothing amazing there. I'm just solving for, just getting all my variables on one side. If you could, um, if you have a constant on that side, could you also just flip that over and just so you can get rid of the constant? Oh, depending on what you're talking about, if you're talking about 
level surfaces, the constants don't matter or shit because they just become K. If you're not talking about level surfaces, then you need that constant still. All right, all right. So the one problem is in, in order for this to become this, does anybody see the problem? Uh, this would have to be what so that I can add it to this side and make it become this. Yes, and, and if we realize that if it was this case, my big ass F is this, and then what's big ass F DZ? Negative freaking one. So that is minus one. So I would add it to this side, and do I recover what I know is true? Yes. So this is the more general way to find a tangent plane to a surface. If I can't solve for Z, and this is the more specifically way if I can solve for Z. Okay, maybe. So there are some homework problems that deal with this, and this is all somewhere at the end of that section. Uh, page 994, they talk about this stuff. Okay. So I wanted to get that out there. Blah, 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 blah. Let me also say this. Uh, I put this on web aside. I just got to go back in and change the points because I'm going to make section 14.8 extra credit. Sort of like not fully officially required in our curriculum. I always like to do it because I'm a physics guy. And there's a lot of physics that's so much easier if you use these Lagrange multipliers. The idea is not that difficult, and if you're going any deeper into physics or math, you probably want to look at that. But I'm going to officially make it extra credit, because we need to make up some time, just to be blunt. So I can't do any extra, anything that's anywhere remote extra I can't do. Um, okay. So let's get back into where we were. I just want to say that one thing from section 14.6. Uh, 14.7, we just barely took a little baby step into it. Um, I want to talk about the second derivatives test and why it makes sense, how it makes sense. Does it make sense? Please, dear God, let it make sense. Uh, so first off, how do we find critical points for some given function? Take the derivative of 7 equal to 0. Good. Or? Where it's undefined. Oh, where it's undefined. I love it. So that's exactly analogous to the procedure in Math 180. It's just that now it's going to require some solving systems of equations, possibly. You with me? I like it. So let me see. For example, I like it. What if I had this here function? Uh, what you got, John? That's a Y there. Take a minute and try to find the critical points for that function. <laughs> Some of you guys reacting like, I gotta do something? What the hell is this shit? Again, you can draw a duck. I won't know. I'll just be happy that you're doing something. Unless you show it to me, and then that's a different story. back here of the gradient times the derivative of r equals zero. That's just coincidental, right, for this situation. That won't apply to future instances of the chain rule. Well, this function is true under this condition. Right. So anytime you're in this condition, then this must be true. 
Okay. Yeah. Cool. But you can't try to extend it past that, right. like, like a general you can't rule go the or opposite something. Way. Yeah, no. No. All right. I purposely, hopefully, you guys see the problem very quickly, right? Yeah. All right. What, what's the problem? So you do f x and you get immediately tells you that there will not be any critical points. Because the other place you look for them is undefined, but this is not undefined anywhere. This is never zero. So, too bad for it. Too bad. All right, so let me give you one that actually works. I'll tell you ahead of time this works. Oh, sorry. Please. You should have known that immediately. Come on now. Uh, so here's one I, I'll tell you up front. I'll tell you that this definitely has critical points. It's got three, actually. I'll tell you that, too. So find the three critical points of this. You don't have to go drill down that deep. Okay. All right. So what's FX? <laughs> Two X minus All right. So right here, and then and what's FY? Four Y minus, minus X squared. Okay. This one looks easier to work with. Right. Because what's got to be true that both of them must be zero at the same time. So don't feel like each thing is its own thing to figure out. If you figure out one of them, that will help you with the other one. So I always start with the one that looks easier. It's not a bad place to start. So what must be true in order for this to be zero? Either what? Yeah, because you can factor this, you get that. So either x is zero. zero. Or y is 1. So on this other guy, what's true to make this 0? Well, 4y has to be x squared, so y has to be x squared over 4, right? But what's the only value that could possibly work for x? 0, right? Or, you know in order to be true. So either x is 0 or y is 1. So when x is 0, what happens to this guy? y is 0. When y is 1, what happens to this guy? I like it. Let me stop there for a second. Right? If y is 1, then x squared equals 4. It's going to be plus or minus 2. So what are my critical points? Now be careful. The critical points, you can answer that as just the points that are in the domain, right? So where are my critical points?
Zero, zero. Two, one. Negative two, one. Okay, I like it. So those are, without question, critical points. Are they, do they each have to be locations of maxes or mins? Of course not. In fact, now that we're in three dimensions, we have the incredibly funky situation of I can be like this on, in the XZ plane, and at the same time like this in the YZ plane. Yes, sir? Or you can be like this in both of them. And then in some other way. Who knows? I like it. In fact, let me see. But if you have, uh, oh, I wish you could remember what website that was. Um, so if I have ax squared plus by squared equals z, if a and b are both positive, can you think about what that surface would look like? It's a cone, right? Yeah, it's going to be this, it's going to open like that, at, at zero, zero. So if it, basically, if I had like one and one for A and B, then the smallest Z could be would be zero. zero. I like it when they're both zero. And then it would just go up from there, and the levels, level curves would be <laughs> circles. I like it, I like it, right? Now, what if I were to let A be negative, so that I actually get, uh, this is if A equals b equals 1. What if a equals negative b? So I get y squared minus x squared equals z. So in the yz plane, that is a parabola facing. And in the xz plane, that is a parabola facing down. I like it. There you go. That's a saddle point. So at least I can graph that found a really cool website where you can slide through values for A and B and it kind of shows you. I'm going to have to try to find that for you because it's really neat. Not right now, thank God. Let's see. Now, if I make one of these negative, see, right now, they both agree with the direction that parabolas want to face. They both want to face up. In fact, they both want to face up in the same uh, symmetrical uh, amount, same kind of slopes. Uh, if I make one negative, then I get this freaky looking thing. Yeah. Let's see if I can do this on this computer. Give it to me. But that's obvious, it's kind of obvious why they call it a saddle point. When I sit on this saddle, I want this to go like this, but this side I want it, it would be very uncomfortable if this side also did this, <laughs> sitting in a bowl, kind of like, uh, that's horrible. Uh, so if I was standing here at the saddle point, I face this way, I go up, but I'm, at the, I'm, at, I'm kind of like at a minimum if I look at it in this direction, right? But if I look at it in this direction, I'm actually at the... So we give it its own name, because it's a freaky-ass thing. It is both a max and a min, depending on which plane you're living in or which direction you're looking. So we act, we call it, remarkably enough, a saddle point. We're like, that looks like a saddle. <laughs> All right, I like it. It's a point you put your butt in the saddle. All right. So from that direction, it looks like a minimum.
That direction looks like a maximum. That same point. I like it. Cool. I like it. Uh, what was my point with that? I forgot. <laughs> that was interesting to look at. Either way. Um, so, so these three points, they could either be nothing. They could be sort of related to that whole, I'm just resting for a second. Or they could be a max, or they could be a min, or they could be a saddle point. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. So, the way we determine this is to do this. I'm going to try to show you why it makes sense, uh, this approach makes sense. And then I've got a little handout for you to do some problems. Thankfully, oh shit, you guys help me remember all this stuff. Um, so the second derivatives test, and of course now it makes sense why I have to be plural on this thing. This is more than one second derivative out there. There's more than one first derivative out there. Oh, shit. So we define this function, we call it D. There's so many Ds running around. And we, we, we do this with it. 